Maccabee here, coming to you from my man cave in Carlsbad, California. I cannot tell you how many times I've been asked to make a video of how I tie the Huck Hopper. Well, I'm finally motivated, so here it is. Over the years, I have sold a gazillion Huck Hoppers off the Tim Huckabee site. Uh, people adore this thing. I adore this thing. I fished it all over the world. I've caught fish all over the world on five continents all over the world, even South Africa. But many of you fly tires want to tie it yourself. I get it. I totally get that. Fly fishing incorporates a lot of pleasures. But one of those pleasures is fooling a fish on a fly that you tied yourself. But first, in terms of background, let me give credit where credit is due. And that's the great Charlie Craven. Charlie Craven is a professional fly tire and he used to be a guide in Colorado. He's a pillar in the fly fishing industry. I've learned so much from Charlie Craven. I probably own all of his books. Here's one of them. Uh, I've read all his articles, and I bet I've seen every video he has ever done. I've never met him, but one day I'd love to. It was Charlie Craven's article in the fall 2007 issue of Hatches Magazine. To change my fly tying life. That was 15 years ago, over 15 years ago. Charlie, Charlie's article titled The Charlie Boy Hopper in that magazine is a testament to fly tying technique and awakening for me to the term guide flies. You see, the Huck Hopper is similar to the Charlie Boy Hopper. There's a technique Charlie Craven invented in the Charlie Boy Hopper. That I'll show you a few minutes, which I use in the Huck Hopper, that truly is genius. It's the basis for what I call the Huck Hopper platform, the, the platform by which I can tie numerous insect imitations. With that technique and the myriad of colors of foam available and a little bit of creativity in terms of shape and size of that foam, I, well, many people have caught a variety of fish species all over the world on the Huck Hopper. If you can master Charlie Craven's fold over foam technique, which I'll show you in a minute, then you can tie the Huck Hopper to imitate an endless variety of dry flies in sizes from tiny to huge battleships, size twos, to imitate the insect species from grasshoppers to caddis to beetles to stoneflies and everything in between. I designed the Huck Hopper for trout, specifically for trout on the Upper Kern River. But the Huck Hopper kills on large and smallmouth bass, too. I know people that have even caught carp and pike on Huck Hoppers. So there's a little background on the Huck Hopper. I'll get to the how of how to make a Huck Hopper in a minute. But first, it's important for me to elaborate the why. In his article, Charlie Craven talks about guiding in South Park, Colorado. And doing well with his clients. But doing well meant the destruction of more than a dozen Dave's hoppers per day. This resulted in Charlie sitting down at the vice for hours at the end of a long day guiding, tying more and more Dave's hopper flies for the next day. Charlie Craven needed a more durable fly that was easy to tie specifically for guiding. A guide fly is a tie, is a fly. It is proven to catch fish, but might not look so pretty in a bin in a fly shop when viewed by a human from above. Trout don't see the top of a floating fly. They only see the underside. There are some elaborate foam-based hopper patterns out there, and many of them work really well, just great. But none of that fanciness on the top of the fly is actually seen by the fish. The fish only sees the underneath side and a, hopefully a shadow of the wing pattern. The guide fly, like the huck hopper, serves many fly fishing scenarios, but attracting humans in a fly shop is not one of them. It's an ugly fly. I call my home waters the Upper Kern River, even though it's 300 miles north of here where I live. I've taught many people how to fly fish on the Upper Kern River, home of the wild native Kern River rainbow. Shoot, my son Mark is a fly fishing guide in Montana, in Bozeman, and he cut his teeth on the Upper Kern River. My favorite stretch of the Upper Kern is within the Golden Trout Wilderness and is accessed by the forks of the Kern Trail. 
typically with a backpack. What I call the Forks is a 15 mile stretch of river above the confluence of the main North Fork of the Kern River and then the Little Kern River. There's not a little, a lot of altitude at that confluence, less than 5,000 feet. And for that 15 miles and beyond the river and its surrounding area supports this huge population of many species of grasshoppers. Between teaching float folks to fly fish, losing these hopper invitations to trees, or simply just having the trout chomp and waterlog those flies, I had a similar problem to Charlie Craven, but I was backpacking. I didn't have the luxury of tying more flies at night exhausted like Charlie did. I simply would run out and be screwed. I needed a durable solution that was easy enough to tie that produced results. It was sheer fate that I ran into Charlie Craven's article. So I started field testing my first prototypes on the upper current, and the results were spectacular. Honestly, there was just one problem. I also needed a nymphing solution in a dry dropper rig. The upper current has deep runs, deep fast runs. We're getting the fly down, down four or five feet produces really well. But hanging two heavy nymphs below a fairly large size six hop, hop, huck hopper would sink it. At the same time, I reasoned that the upper current river should never see a bobber. The river's too special, wild natives. The upper current within the Golden Trout Wilderness is designated as a wild and scenic river by the state of California. It's one of the very few places left in the world that supports a majority of wild natives. The Kern River Rainbow is its own subspecies of the rainbow trout. So I started tying huge huck hoppers in sizes two and four. I call them battleships. And to my surprise, the Kern River rainbows continue to attack them. In fact, even the little Kern River rainbows would rise to those giant hoppers, not able to get them in their mouth, but grabbing them by the legs and pulling them down to drown them. Big flies equals big fish. And I started to get some monster Kern River rainbows. And those big huck hoppers could hold up to even the heaviest of nymphs all day long. Doubles were now not a rare thing on the upper current with me with a big huck hopper on top. Okay, let's jump in and let me show you how to tie it. First, let's talk materials. And the most important material in the huck hopper is the foam, the color, the size. Here are some examples. There's a ton of stuff that I own. Examples of fly foam. This one's done by Hairline. It's two millimeters in width. This is also Hairline three millimeters in width. In in um, in width. Light blue, by the way, like damselfly. Okay. And then this is done by Rainies. This is a full quarter inch. That's super thick. Uh, all these go for about, oh, $2 to $2.50. And your local fly shop has this stuff. And, of course, all the Internet retailers have them, too. Uh, but my point is I don't even use this stuff anymore because I found Michael's and I found Hobby Lobby. And they sell sheet foam for 99 cents in this giant, this is like an 11 by 17 sheet, 99 cents. This is tan, kind of a lightish brown, which would be typical of most, not all, but not most, but typical of a huck hopper up the Kern River. But there's fancy stuff too, like here's gold, right? And then, you know, 20,000 or 2022 was the year of the pink and the, purple hopper at least it was in in montana it's 99 cents um and this is uh, 1.5 millimeter by the way and i overcome that i'll show you with a binding strip in a second on how i tied that but you know, there's only one thickness but for 99 cents you could get every color in the rainbow anyways in montana you know purple was the the color of the year in 2022 for hoppers there are no purple hoppers in nature as far as I know, there's no insects in nature that are purple, maybe in the Amazon or something like that. Um, but you ever wonder why a purple haze works? A purple haze is just a an atoms, like a parachute atoms that's tied with a purple body. It's because it's the last color seen in the spectrum underwater. 
So if a trout's super deep and it's looking up through darkness, it sees purple before any of the other colors. So that's why purple works. So, um, you know, and that's, I don't know why pink works, <laughs> but it does. Okay. But um, I don't know, a couple of months ago, I was with my wife shopping and I'm like, oh, I want to stop in at that Michael's and uh, check out this stuff. This is all foam, like a zebra type pattern, big scales. Well, I've definitely used this on hot coppers. That's fantastic. Um, and it works. <laughs> they rise to these things. They eat this stuff. And then this is a no-brainer. I mean, look at those colors. That's a no-brainer. But anyways, that's where I get my foam. Michael's Craft Store or, or Hobby Lobby. And I assume those are scattered throughout the U.S., but I, I don't know. Okay, in terms of hooks, this hook is perfect. The TMC 5212. Perfect, sort of. It would be perfect if they made this hook in a size 4 and a size 2. In large sizes, they're not. And that's a bummer for me. Um, but this is a standard wire width. They say 2x in length. It, it, it goes more like a 3x in length. It's, it's perfect for hopper and, and terrestrial patterns. But like I said, they don't sell it in a, in a 4 and a 2, which I'm going to tie in a minute. I'm going to tie a 4. This is the hook I use for a size 4. It's not even made in a 2. That, that hook doesn't exist. This is a Daiichi 1270. So I tie a lot of these, but I think you could see the issue or the problem. And, and this would be my um, hug hopper skeleton in the closet. And that is, it's curved. So when I get to tie in a minute, uh, I got to bend it. It's not ideal, but it is what it is. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. In terms of thread, I use heavy. So this is a 3.0 uni thread. Um, in UTC ultra thread, that would the equivalent would be like a 210 in width. You know, heavy, strong, because you got to pull really tight on these huck hoppers. And the last thing you want it to do is do a thread break. Um, during during the tie I'm using tan um, and this is a tan huck hopper and this is one of those flies where you barely see any of the thread this is the only thread that is seen certainly the only thread that's seen by the trout and it's simply used for segmentation purposes so I like to kind of match the foam color tan to the thread color tan um, but there's an argument to use different colored thread. Again, it, it's just not seen a lot. So color really doesn't matter that that much. There'd be an argument for white thread or clear thread, mono. Um, all right, in terms of legs, uh, I use, I buy this uh, Jan's Netcraft rubber leg stuff in bulk. They see it comes in these um, strips. And I cut, cut the strips to length. Mm -hmm. This is like a, a tan or a pumpkin color and a brown. I cut them to length and then I bar them with a permanent black marker to give that barring effect. And sorry about the reflection off that plastic bag, but you'll, you'll see these better when I pull them out in a second. There are a gazillion legs on the market, um, some expensive, some not expensive that you could use. And legs are important for this particular fly. Um, you know, they're just detractors, big, long legs. In fact, you know, my joke, we're, we're showing the view from the trout. My joke with the my guide buddies in Montana is um, the huck hopper is a giant worm with these big, long legs like some weird terrestrial would have. The head of a praying mantis and this giant light splayed wing. So it really doesn't imitate a grasshopper per se or any bug in nature per se but it has just enough components of attraction um that that make it work okay that wing on top is bleached elk i deer is fine i like elk because it's bigger thicker um the uh this elk right here is long long uh, you know and i use that on the big huck hoppers and then this is a shorter bleached elk um so I use it on the smaller huck hoppers. I use the bleached elk so I could see it. So if, if I do that big hero cast, you know, sometimes you really got to cast far because you're in clear, crystal clear water, right? 
So if I do that big hero cast, I can still see this thing 60, 70 feet away, whether it's upriver or downriver. All right, in terms of glue and putting this together, I am not stingy about using a ton of Sally Hansen's. If you don't know this hot trick, uh, Sally Hansen's is nail polish that you could buy in any grocery store or pharmacy. Um, and they sell like 30 versions of clear. This is called Miracle Gel Top Coat Clear. Um, but I've used easily five, six different types of clear uh, for, for this particular fly and many foam flies that I tie. Um, in terms of head cement, I don't use it. I use um, good old super glue. You know what? You tie a lot of flies when you buy super glue by the case. I have tried everything, every adhesive, every glue available for um, gluing foam together and nothing works like super glue. So if you're gonna tie f foam flies, let me sell, save you the frustration and the money. Just use super glue. All right, let's get to tying. Okay, here we go. Here's that uh, Diachi 1270 in a size four. So pretty big fly, pretty huge huck hopper, certainly capable of, of holding up two heavy nymphs all day um so here's what i was talking about i learned this little trick from uh, a number of tires out there and that is i'm going to use friction and then just body heat to warm this hook up so that i can bend it i'm pulling straight up i'm trying to bend this curved hooks up so it so the the this part of it as opposed to the hook gap um, gets flat and then at the end i'll pull it down to make that hook gap smaller so see it's coming into shape it's getting flatter it's not going to be perfect um and the more you try to get perfect the more you're going to snap these and, and yeah i've snapped hooks before um, it's not dangerous because the the dangerous part the sharp point stays in the vise if you snap the hook right Okay, so I'm just out there. I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm going to warm that up. I'm using a Renzetti Traveler. I just tightened it up. And I'm pulling it straight down so I can make that hook gap smaller. Or, or pull the hook gap back to where it used to be. All right, that, that's, looking, that's looking pretty good. That's looking much better, that's for sure. Okay, um, so um, you want to cut your foam... And this is that 1.5 width stuff that I buy at Michael's or or um, uh, the craft stores, um, Hobby Lobby. You want to cut it to the, the width of the hook gap, okay? And then I'll use a binding strip in a minute. And you basically want that um, two-thirds of the size to half size of the hook gap. This is thicker. This isn't that cheap stuff I buy at the craft store. This is the, you know, um, standard two millimeter or bigger fly foam and that's how i overcome how thin this is because in the middle of this fly it's gonna have this big thick strip you'll see it'll make a lot more sense in the beginning all right you're gonna watch this closely and you're gonna go what the hell is he doing uh, but this is the genius of charlie craven um, this is that fold over foam technique uh, i'm going with my right hand i'm holding it in my left I'm going to basically put the hook in at the middle of the foam. I could go farther by tilting it, and that would give me a bigger um, butt or tail. Um, or, but for this, for this purposes, and and most huck hoppers, you just want to go in, you know, in the middle of it. Can you see that? And I'm just going to pierce it right through there. I've gone in through the middle. Make sense? See that? Okay, now I'm gonna put it on the vise. And the trick with tying this fly, or one of the annoyances of tying this fly, is just keeping this thing out of the way. It's sitting nicely back here. Most of the time I let it just sit down right here. Okay, so I'm gonna take my tying thread and I'm gonna spin in a clockwise direction to tighten the thread. Thread is just a bunch of fibers that are all bound up together. Well, I'm binding them tighter. In this fly, unlike in a tiny dry fly, 
uh, I want a ribbing type effect. I want a really tight uh, bind on the thread for the friction because I'm going to put the foam directly on top of this. All right, let me trim this up and then finish it off. Now, I take this beyond the hook, the, um, the barb, uh, because I have this little butt that'll hang out there. And frankly, you know, it covers up some of the metallic look. Uh, but really, you're going to start the first segment of this fly at the hook, at the barb. So I'll let it sit there at the barb. Uh, I hope you can see that. There, you can see that. All right. Um, and, and there, and, uh, in a smaller huck hopper, in other words, from size like 8 to 12, I won't use the binding strip right here. Uh, I'll just tie it as is because they're so tiny that the fly would be thicker than it is longer. But in these big flies, I've got to use the binding strip. So I'll come back as quickly as possible with the red wraps to the top here. And now is where I'm going to use super glue to tie in the binding strip. Whoopsie, there's a little bit much, so I'll just ease that out. And uh, it, I should tell you now, or, or you might go without saying that um, when you tie huck hoppers, it can get really messy uh, on your hands because you're using this stuff. Now, let me get this stuff out of the way again. So there's my binding strip. I now have it sitting on the hook. And because it's crazy glue, I mean, it's sticking by itself. So now I'm going to just cinch this down, but I'm not going to go too tight. Whoopsie. I'm not going to go too, too tight on this guy um, because we are, um, if you go too tight, you're, you're eliminating the buoyancy of the fly. So I'm just going to do big, long thread uh, wraps back to the, the hook point now. And I'm going to snip off and I'm going to leave a little bit of a tail to bind to. So I'm not snipping off tight. I have a little bit of tail there. Now you can see that how this is kind of shaping up. Another brilliant thing by Charlie Craven, uh, or maybe I made this up. The way I'm gonna find where I'm gonna poke this guy is I'm pulling slightly and I'm gonna make an indent right here. Okay, now I, you can see I have an indent and I'm gonna poke a hole big enough to pass the eyelet through. This is that fold over foam technique. And I'm gonna, without tearing the foam, I'm gonna work my way to get that eyelet to barely peek through the fly. Use my fingernail a little bit. There we go, here it comes. Yes, okay. So now you can see that I have the beginnings of what you can see is going to end up like a hot copper, right? I glue that together, start, start singeing things down and you can see the brilliance of this, I think so far. So I'll just trim it. It's not, it's not, um, doesn't need to be exact because ultimately we're going to trim this guy back. Now, more, more crazy glue to bind foam to foam. And you don't want to be too liberal ever with crazy glue. I think that goes without saying because it gets everywhere. It gets on your hands. No matter what, if you tie these, it's going to get on your hands. But I'm trying to do a light film uh, on the top part of it so that I can pull it down, line her up. And it's not even important to line this up perfectly. Now I'm using pressure on all sides of this guy to tighten this down. Alrighty, nice. All right, I'm gonna give my thread a spin again. That's probably off camera. Yes, it is off camera, but I'm spinning my thread in a clockwise direction to get it tight because I'm gonna pull tight. Now, totally up to you. But in a big fly like this, I typically do four segments, okay? Now, and three wraps to get a segment. I'm pulling really tight. There's my first segment, okay? Now, from the underside, check it out. There's that. Oh, we need to overcome that, don't we? Look at that. Um, you know what? I'm going to fix this right now. This is a good example of 
fixing something that didn't work. I guess I didn't get enough crazy glue in here to singe this guy down. Not a crisis because the trout won't see this, but it's bothering me. So I'm just going to fix it right now. There we go. Now I've glued it back together. Actually, it would have fixed itself if I would just would have singed it. I never look on that side of the fly. So, um, but now I'm going to come across the top in a diagonal direction and pick where I want that segment to be. And I'll do one, two, three wraps. There's the brilliance right there. See, you've got a crossing wrap there, but the trout's not going to see that. And frankly, um, you're not going to see that because it's going to be under the wing. And check out below. You know, there's our segment. So now that I'm there, let me get a third segment. One, two, three. And I told you uh, on these, uh, I told, I made the comment about it. it's got the head of a praying mantis. It kind of looks like one now, but if you really want the head of a praying mantis, you make it smaller. So I'll just do that as an example. Again, how many segments you use is up to you. I believe a grasshopper has four segments, a, a natural one, but I could be wrong. So, okay. So now I'm going to take this. I'm going to singe really tight. One, two, three, and now check it out. He's got the head of a praying mantis um, and and then that segmented body of a worm. And all you see are the segments or all the trout sees is a segment. All right. So at this point, Charlie Craven, because his um, Charlie Boy Hopper is much, looks much look more like a grasshopper. He trims that praying mantis head down so that it's flatter, that it looks like a grasshopper. I found the trout love that head. So I just keep it there. It may be just be me. You're welcome to trim it and you, you know, you do that type of thing. At this point though, I need to shape the tail. And this is also different from Charlie. If I do a, a tail like Charlie, he takes uh, a razor blade and shimmies it down flat. Um, um, and, and loses a lot of bulk of the tail or what we could call the tail. I need bulk because Think about it. In a dry dropper situation, this is the buoyancy part. This is the part that needs to float the best. So with as much buoyancy as possible, I just kind of developed a, a spade type shape. And it's also quick to do too. So I will cut um, straight across to a point, but not losing a lot of the bulk. Now I get a spade type look to it. All right, beautiful. Um, Good, let's move on to legs. Okay, I forgot eyes and everyone knows that um, the hook hopper is not gonna work without eyes in it. That's a joke. It, the eyes are not gonna be seen by the trout, you know, unless the the trout, the hook hopper lands like this, which it could. And if you've ever seen uh, a grasshopper that has landed um, in the water, with its wings out, it's like a complete yard sale. You know, they're splayed everywhere. Sometimes they land upside down like that and they're totally stuck. Once their wings are wet, it's over. You know, they're just floating by, um, hoping to, to have the current take them to the bank before they get munched. All right, so in a, in a big huck hopper like this that has so many segments, I'm gonna back up one segment and notice the cross wrap right there. That's gonna be under the wing. No one will ever see it. We still have integrity on the bottom of the fly. And I'm going to tie in um, a leg below on this side, get it to the length I want, which is about that. Uh, you, I do a, a kind of shorter leg in front and a longer leg in back. You might want to have them even. I've, I'm tightening the thread by spinning it. I'm getting the legs to about the same length. I could always trim them later, right? And now I'm going to come over here and let me show it to you. I'm not going to pin the leg right now because sometimes that screws it up. I'm going to just come across giving my second cross wrap. Um, and then I'll catch the, this leg on the other side, come across, get this leg and you want them, you know, you're going to have, you're, you're going to have the leg exposed right here to sight, but not by the trout. That's just, you're going to see it. Right, and that's okay. Now here's here's a trick. If I want the legs to go backwards, I tie behind them, I wrap behind them. If I want them to go forwards, like I want these two front legs to go forwards, um, and notice I'm keeping the integrity 
of the bottom of the fly with just the segments and I've got as many cross wraps as I want up here because it's gonna be um, hidden but I come in front of the leg and see how that pulls it forward so if I want both these legs pulled forward a little bit you never know what this rubber is gonna do and I kind of want them to be flat or somewhat hanging this is like perfect look how long these legs are those are just gonna dangle in the water right and then now I'm just gonna come over and get myself back to the front of the fly because this is where I'm going to tie in the wing okay here's the part of the video I wish existed when I first started tying when all the guidance back in the old days it's probably fixed now but back in the old days 20 years ago you'd learn about spinning deer hair and how to manage deer hair or elk hair in this case they always started with some great tire holding a cup of hair in their hands it was always start from there and when i would go in and try and cut out a clump of hair i just cause a complete calamity and i could never figure out how in the world they could get it into their hands so nicely so I bass awkward stumbled through trial and error and a lot of error into simply pricking out the clump that I want from with a bobkin bodkin okay see I've got that in my right hand now I'm gonna come in with my left hand and let that fall back into my fingers now I've got it okay I've pinched on it and then come in with my cheap scissors the ones that I don't mind getting dull and just cutting that clump from here uh, see how that came out now look it's in my hand and it's perfectly lined up right so I'm just gonna pinch it and grab it lower so that I can pull out some of the guard hairs now on the huck hopper look how look how pretty much even that is i don't i don't need to try that's pretty flat sorry i need to get into focus there now i'm pulling out guard hairs and i'll blow on it and do that but i'm not going to comb it like this was a size 18 elk haired caddis i'm not going to comb out the guard hairs there's nothing wrong with a little bit of guard hairs making it into the huck hopper not at all but see now I have it in a perfect position and now I can lay it right on top of the foam body the huck hopper I don't have to trim I don't even have to give it a haircut once it's tied in there okay there's a little guidance tip for you now let's tie it in but before I tie it in I'd be remiss to mention that I don't use a hair stacker to stack the hair with the huck hopper um, for one reason it's a huge clump on these size four huck hoppers that that's a giant clump of elk hair so it's kind of hard to stack and number two i really don't need it to look trim at the ends of the elk hair on top i want it to look like a splayed out grasshopper in distress so that's why i don't use a hair stacker and in in guide flies it's all about tying quickly so when i eliminate the hair stacker i'm doing this a lot quicker than i would if i had a hair stacker in my hand okay now let's tie this wing on uh firstly i'm gonna be i'm gonna lather on the sally hansen's um because for for i don't know two or three reasons number one that provides a coating uh that'll help waterproof the fly even though it's foam it does take in water number two obviously it's going to secure all those thread wraps see how i've lathered the top all the way back and then number three it's going to help the head of um this fly um it's going to help uh secure the the uh L care so uh here i go i'm gonna my first wrap and i'm working my way you can't see it on this side but i'm working my way around the legs on this side so i don't catch them some every once in a while you catch them i'm gonna twist my thread again just to be sure i don't i'm gonna pull really hard because i want this thing to pop up and i i don't want um to break this thing and i break them all the time and with so much another thing about the the sally hansen's putting it on there so liberally is if i do break the thread it 
it's already glued in there so it won't come undone. Now, I, I'm not anal about coming behind and uh, making sure I don't trap any of those fibers. I'm, I'm just gonna go straight and I'm pulling a little bit harder. Now, because I'm pulling so hard on this thread, you can't really see it from my side and it's not easy for me to show it, but it's pulling this down a bit. So I'm, I'm just gonna recenter it. I'm gonna pinch it back so that it's vertical. And then I'm gonna pull again and I usually go two or three. This is not, you know, a size 20 dry fly. So the amount of wraps isn't really going to kill me. Okay, so I've pinched that up there. That looks pretty good. Um, so I'm going to let go now of the wing and see how that's pulled up and popped up. That's what we want. That's what we want it, uh, to imitate a grasshopper, a natural one that has splayed itself in the river and is defenseless. All right, now let me just matterelli this thing um, so that it's secure. At this point, there's so much glue on there, the Sally Hansons, that I really need, don't need to go three, but for you guys, I just will. Now I'm going to make sure I'm, watch this technique with my fingers my, on my right hand. I'm going to pull up and pinch as I really cinch this thing down. You know, at this point, I'm not worried about breaking the thread, but it's not going to break. Um, and then I'll just come and uh, trim it off. And there we go. There's a huck hopper. In fact, that's a good one. I, I'd like to fish that. This is making me want to fish right now. Uh, all right, cool.